Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this chilly December evening. I hope that you are all doing well. I'm excited to spend some time talking to you tonight about science and literacy with children's books in our last 2021 webinar. So we are coming to you from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. I'm specifically with the K-12 program where we create innovative resources and trainings that build science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity and engage in citizen science projects. My name is Kelly Schaefer and I am our outreach coordinator. And I am joined today by Susan Licker who will be answering your questions and sharing a bunch of links with you in the chat window. So feel free to try and stump her in there. <laughs> So before we get into things too much, I just wanted to throw a question out to y'all and see. Hang on. Sorry, I could tell I was about to have a technical difficulty there and I didn't wanna blow out your eardrums with my sound. Hopefully there's no echo for you right now. So I wanted to throw out this question to you. What do you like about teaching with children's books? And if you're new to Zoom, you're going to want to find the chat window by looking for the speech bubble icon. Make sure that you're sending to everyone instead of just hosts and panelists. Go ahead and share your thoughts. Seeing folks saying that they're highly engaging for students of all ages, that you can make all sorts of different connections when you use them, the rich language and the beautiful art engages children and you as an educator, awesome, yeah. I enjoy the books and I'm enthusiastic about using them, right? Like our energy definitely translates for our students for sure. So I'm seeing a lot about beautiful illustrations, drawing kids in and us in as educators, the opportunity to provide background information that we can then draw connections from, sparking interests in stories um, and phenomena. Yeah, so stories can be a really great way to kind of capture some of the really cool magnitude of some of these phenomena we get to talk about. Anything we say, we can write. Anything we write, we can read. Love Children's Lit for language and literacy learning. Yeah, awesome. So there's a power in stories that I'm seeing kind of echoed throughout your comments. They draw us in, they grab our attention, and for our students, they can be incredibly engaging. And they open all sorts of doors for us as educators to make really cool connections to the topics we wanna to teach about, whether that be science or building language skills. So my goals for this webinar really are to dive into some of those things that you brought up. We're gonna talk about some creative ways to engage kids in STEM using children's trade books as the inspiration. I'm gonna walk you through a couple different ways that you can access these book guides and other resources from around the lab. And we'll, we'll actually kind of get an overview of some of the activities included in these book guides that I'll share with you. So thanks for coming on this journey tonight. 
it is my goal that for like every book I bring up, I'll also bring up a kind of supplemental resource or idea that you could uh, use to enhance it from the lab suite of resources because we've got a lot out there and it's hard to keep track of everything. So I wanna draw some connections there for everybody as well. So we are gonna be focusing on our free book guides for educators. These use children trade books to really encourage reading, writing and art skills while having a science and outdoor connection. So being from the lab of ornithology, we use birds as kind of this inspiration for a lot of what we talk about. And we are fortunate enough to be working in conjunction with the Cornell Lab Publishing Group. So we're able to also put out books that have those as the focus. Most of the books I talk about tonight will be Cornell Lab Publishing Group books, but I will be talking about others and there are others, or excuse, at least an example of one other, and there are others on our website as well. So there are a couple different ways that you can access these book guides. And I just actually, I'm gonna leave the PowerPoint for a second here and I wanna go to our website. So hopefully you're seeing our main website page, which is birds.cornell.edu backslash K12. And here's how you can access um, the book guides in one way. And that is to go to our lessons and activities where we have everything broken down by age group. We have book guides for K2 and 3-5. So you'll just wanna select your age group and then go down until you see free book guides and click on that. And that's gonna have all of the book guides that have um, a guide that includes your age range of students in the standards. So for example, Crow Not Crow, which is K through three is gonna be listed on both the K2 and 3.5. Um, but if you just go to your age group, you'll at least see um, all the ones that apply. And there's a mix, as I said, of CLPG or the Cornell Lab Publishing Group and non. So like White Owl, Barn Owl is a really classic beloved um, children's book. And we've got some really fun activities for that one. All right, so that's one way then you would find it. And the other would be, we actually have um, a CLPG page, which I will ask Susan to share. Um, there's an easier way to find it, but with Zoom, little bar blocking my screen here, <laughs> we're gonna go the search route. So we have a page that just captures all of the book guides um, from the publishing group books here. So if you aren't as interested in age group, this is another good way to go about it. All right, so that's the two ways that you can access these book guides. Let's talk a little bit about what they include. So each book guide is gonna be targeted to specific grades since they are standard aligned. We do wanna focus on a particular age groups. The web page for each book will tell you the age group, tell you where you can get a copy of the book and have the guide that you can download. And once you download the guide on the front cover is gonna be the standards breakdown. So we looked at the next generation science standards as well as English language arts and mathematics common core standards and the National Core Art Standards. As you guys brought up in your reasons for why you love children's books, there's just these amazing art connections. So we definitely wanted to make sure that we were hitting those and taking the best advantage of them as we could in these guides. So we definitely included those standards as well. The first book I want to share with you is On Bird Hill by Jane Yolen. Jane Yolen is a celebrated children's book author. And this book is really cute and sweet. I think I've given it to every young child that I've known <laughs> since it came out. It is very whimsical. The artwork, as you can see sampled here, is very whimsical. And the writing style is, is cute and poetic. So 
And on that twig, I saw a nest and in that nest, a bird at rest. Beneath that bird, there was an egg, a little chick all beak, wing, leg. So you can kind of get just from that little excerpt, a picture of what this story is about. So it does a great job of just kind of hinting at the life of birds in the nest, which is a really great jumping off point for so many explorations of life and science. One of the activities that the guide includes is a fun fact or fiction game. You can see the choices here. Let's go ahead and do a couple of them. Let's, let's uh, use the chat window and you can say whether you think something is true or false. Um, and we'll start with number one, all birds build nests. Do you think that is true or false? Oh, the falses are just rolling in. I can't fool you. <laughs> what makes you say false for number one? Oh, I needed to scroll. <laughs> there were a lot more falses than I realized. Some use cavities, so they might not actually build much of a nest. Some use the ground. Oh, J. Duffy is bringing up brown-headed cowbirds. Yes, our obligate brood parasites who lay their eggs in other birds' nests. Yeah, awesome. Great examples, everyone. Um, one that your kids might know um, from penguin documentaries are our emperor penguins who hold their eggs on their feet. Great. Let's look at number two. Some birds give birth to live babies rather than eggs. True or false? And feel free to share your thoughts on why you chose your answer as well. And while you're typing, one of the things I really like about this activity is it's a really great way to kind of take the pulse of what your students know about birds and what they don't. Uh, and you can kind of gauge where you might want to spend a little time with them. Yes, this is false. This is one of the key features of birds is that they lay hard shelled eggs. It's one of the things that makes a bird a bird. All right, let's look at number six. We're gonna jump down just a little bit. Most, oh, excuse me, only the female mother bird sits on the eggs. What do you think? Is that one true or false? Yeah. Can anybody think, I'm seeing lots and lots of falses. Can anybody think of an example? That proves it's false. Penguins share nest duties for sure. I think I often think that it's kind of like bigger birds that come to mind for me. And maybe that's just because they have the opportunity to observe them through nest cams, which is something we'll talk about. Yeah, eagles, uh, hawks. They share duties. The bird that always comes to mind for me, that's the opposite, where only the female is taking care of the nest is hummingbirds because the males typically aren't involved at all. Well, past a point, obviously. <laughs> all right, great. Thanks for playing along a little bit. Let's check out some more activities from Onbird Hill. 
So a lot of the activities here are kind of geared towards gauging what students know, allowing them the opportunity to share what they've observed and seen, and then kind of building on that. So here we have this opportunity to talk about what you already know about birds, nests, and eggs. And then from there, kind of go into an activity that allows you to explore that more in depth. Um, and this is one of my very favorite activities to do with kids of all age groups. I've actually had a blast doing this with adults as well. And it's building a nest. So challenging your students to build their nests using only natural materials, um, things like sticks, grass, twigs, pine cones, mud, things like that. Um, if for whatever reason you can't get outside or you're doing blended or remote learning and your students can't get outside, you can do it with uh, indoor materials as well, like pipe cleaners and recyclables and things like that. You can level this challenge up for your students. Older students, you can challenge them to um, use their hands like bird beaks. So kind of connect the first four fingers and then just leave the thumb out and then use their hands more like bird beaks to build their nest. You can also challenge them to make a nest that will hold a certain amount of rocks to represent eggs. Um, and when I've seen this done with high school students, that's how I've seen it done is kind of this level up challenge where it has to hold these rocks which represent eggs and then uh, the teacher will shake it around and make it like a windy day. So uh, you can kind of up the engineering challenge as you see fit. And then it provides you with the opportunity to discuss, uh, you know, is it easier or hard to build a bird nest? Is it easier for you with thumbs versus a bird with its beak? What materials do you think a bird might use that you didn't use or you materials you use that a bird wouldn't? So there's all sorts of great discussion opportunities with a fun hands-on activity like this one. And this is both one of my favorite activities from the guide and one of my favorite illustrations from the guide. So, oh, excuse me, from the book. Um, I love this illustration of the egg cracked open and inside you see this gorgeous little painting of a house at night, kind of symbolizing what the egg was for the bird as it developed. And something that you'll find with your, your kids, especially younger kids, is they haven't really thought about what is in the eggs they eat and that they are actually from birds. And so an egg exploration or an egg dissection is a really great way to have them look at something they probably see fairly regularly in a new way. And so the guide kind of walks you through a step-by-step -step egg dissection. It has this really great illustration of what the inside of an egg looks like. If you're like me and you've like cracked open eggs before and seen that kind of white membrane-y thing and not known what it was, you'll be delighted to discover it's called the chalaza, which is very satisfying to say. So it's a really fun activity. It's got that little bit of yuck factor that gets kids excited and feeling like they're doing something like extra exciting. Um, and it, we encourage kids to look at all the parts of the egg. So the egg shell, the inside, the outside, um, all these different parts that you see on the diagram as well. So it's just a really great activity for thinking about how birds develop in their eggs. Okay, so that's just a sampling of the activities that accompany the book. There's more than eight, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview. And we're going to head back to the internet for a second here because I want to, um, sorry, I can't get at my tabs. There we go. I want to take you to allaboutbirds.org backslash cams. So the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a number of bird cams, and I think this is a really great supplement 
to the Onward Hill book, which gives you an idea of what it's like to be a little bird in a nest. And this take can, allows you to take it to like a, the next level where you could actually see real live birds in their nests. This time of year, um, most of the nest cams are not gonna be active, but if you were doing this in the spring or even starting in as early as February, some of these are gonna start being active again. Um, and you can scroll through up here and see the different cams that we have. Um, if you're doing it in an off time and you still would like to use the bird cams, there are great playlists on the Cornell Lab of Ornithology YouTube channel, but there's also um, highlights for each one. So I clicked on the red tail hawk cams, which is right here at um, Cornell campus. And if you scroll down, you'll see video highlights. And so, for example, we'll click on this one, the Cornell Hawk Cam season highlights. And let me make sure I'm sharing my sound for y'all. Let's just watch just a, a little bit of this so you can get an idea for what goes on in these bird cams and what you might be able to see. I love how there's still snow in the nest. Here's an example of the male helping to incubate. So as we can see here, it took 37 days for the first chick to hatch. And I think that's kind of can be surprising for our students how long the nesting can be for these bigger birds, how long it takes to grow up and be ready to fly as well. So you get these incredible intimate looks at what it's like to grow up in a nest. I will say, and I wanted to show this up to this point because you'll see things like that over on the side of that where you're gonna see prey, you're gonna see things brought to the nest. So you'll need to prepare your students for seeing prey items brought in. And every once in a while, it's gonna be something recognizable, a squirrel. I mean, there's been an instance of like on the Eagle cams, cats being brought, which might be a little upsetting. So it's an opportunity to talk about life and nature and the reality of that for uh, birds and others. All right. So those are the bird cams. The next book I want to chat with you about is called Crow Not Crow. This is another one by Jane Yolen. I'm a big fan of this book. I think it is a really excellent way to introduce the idea of identifying birds. So the idea behind this book is that there's a young girl and uh, she has older brothers who go birding with her father and they're all really good at identifying birds and she doesn't really know how to yet and she feels kind of bad about it and she wants to be able to identify birds and she starts thinking maybe the boys have better eyes and her father teaches her how to i begin to identify birds using the really simple method crow or not a crow and so this is a really awesome way for our littlest learners to start figuring out how to identify birds um, and the crow is a great subject for this because as the book says, it's all black. Uh, all, its wings are black, its eyes are black, its beak is black, its legs are black. So um, you can kind of get walked through that process in this book. So some of the activities that you'll run into, 
uh, build off of that ID philosophy. So the very first one is what makes a crow a crow. Um, and a good entry point into this would be having your students brainstorm a list of birds they've seen before, or if you're familiar with the Merlin Bird ID app, you can use that to find the most likely birds in your area and have a list and choose one from that to start doing a little Venn diagram with. So great way to start talking about similarities and differences. So for example, let's look at these birds that we have here and I'll ask you to put just in a chat window, if we were looking at it from the perspective of the book where we would know that a crow is um, all black everywhere, what are some similarities and differences that you might uh, come up with for these birds that we're looking at? On the left, we do have an American crow and on the right, we have red-winged blackbirds. So what's something that stands out to you? Both have black feathers, absolutely. That would go in our similarities section. The beak shape is a little bit different. Yeah, we've got this kind of more chunky rounded versus the very pointed of the red-winged blackbird. A difference would be the red and yellow on the epaulets or the wings of the red winged blackbird. Absolutely, both have a black beak. Mm -hmm. Different size, sure. This one stands out to me in this picture is we have the male in front and the female behind of the same species. And so the male and female look different, which is not the case for the crow. So that's another cool one. So just by looking at these birds, we can come up with quite a list of different things, different tail feather shape, love that, absolutely. Um, and then if you are gonna do this with your students who maybe don't have as much experience looking at birds or you wanted them to do some research beforehand, there's lots of resources from the lab that could help you. So you could use the Merlin Bird ID app, or you could use All About Birds website, which is our online field guide. And you could actually do some research. I like to do it in like a two stage, like what can you tell just by looking at it? And then what can you tell um, by doing some research and reading about like what they eat and where they live and things like that. Another really cool activity is the call nut chuck. So in the book, the protagonist notices that the grackle chucks or the red-winged blackbird chucks. So that's the sound it makes when it calls and the crow calls when it calls. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell when I'm saying a W call <laughs> or in a double L call. <laughs> um, but bird songs and sounds are different between species. And this can be a new idea to kids too. And it can be a really fun thing to explore. So each book guide has an accompanying resource page on our website. So we're going to dash over to the Crow Not Pro one real quick. Um, and each activity will have, if, it, if you need links, they'll be there on that page. So here you can see different links to sounds. And so the idea behind this activity is that you would play the sound for the students without them seeing the name of the bird and then challenge them to describe it in some way or whistle it and mimic it. So for example, you could play the Northern Cardinal call. I always call this one um, a kid with a toy laser gun. Pew, 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 pew. And then compare it to something like the morning dove, which has a very different call. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
when I listen to that call, I can really understand why it was named a morning dove. It sounds like it is crying. And then something like our friend, the classic LMS Blue Jay. catalog number 173749. Very nice of them to say part of their name, I think. J, J. And also you can look at the spectrograms, which can be a fun way to and a new way for kids to think about sound. I really enjoy trying to get kids to describe the sound or draw the sound, try to come up with words for the sound, um, like a mnemonic word that represents the sound. And then if you want to explore bird songs further than the ones that we've selected, you can always go to the Macaulay Library, which is the largest natural sound repository, and you can Google for birds that you know are around you. Not Google search, excuse me. So another, oh, how would you see the spectrograph? Um, Hopefully it was showing up on my screen. So when you go to Macaulay Library, or um, if you look it up on Merlin and play the song there, or um, what I was showing on my screen just a moment ago, the spectrogram is there. Um, so Macaulay Library will always play a spectrogram for you too, if you look up a sound through there. Oh, how would you use a spectrogram to teach? Great question. Um, I'm going to say that usually when I talk about spectrograms, I'm talking with older age kids um, because you kind of have to talk about like pitch and volume and things like that. Um, but I've played uh, with spectrograms with like third graders before with some success. And so I would actually recommend if you're interested in diving into spectrograms more, there's a really fun game on the Bird Academy website called Bird Song Hero. And it will actually kind of walk you through how to look at and think about spectrograms. And then it's a matching game. You play a sound and then you try and match it to the spectrogram on the side. And so that is a really great way to introduce the idea of spectrograms. And Susan just shared a link to Birdsong Hero in the window. Okay, cool. So another resource that I wanna highlight for you, and you're gonna actually hear me mention Cooped Up Kids multiple times um, because we have so many different activities here. Our Cooped Up Kids activities, if you've joined us for a previous webinar, you're probably familiar with these, but they are Grade banded online based activities that use Google Slideshows to be a more self directed experience for three, five, and six, eight. But through the K2 um, kids, there you do need an adult to go through them with it. But they have these amazing themes. And so to accompany the Crow Not Crow, I highly recommend checking out. Activity five, which focuses on bird ID, choose the gray band that works for you and dive on in. What's great is if you don't have access to the Crow Not Crow book, um, oh, looks like the video is not gonna work for me. Sorry about that. But in the K2 activity, we have a recording of our friend Leo from the visitor center at the lab reading Crow Not Crow. And he does a great job with it. So you can um, experience the book in that way if you don't have access to it. Um, so if you check out activity five for K2, you'll find the reading there. And then it goes further into other ways to think about bird identification. For example, these um, silhouettes. A really great way to start thinking about how to identify birds is by placing them in groups because that really helps narrow things down and you can place them in groups 
of common birds like owls and songbirds and ducks um, and hawks by looking at the shape. So that's what these silhouettes encourage you to do. So if you're interested in bird identification with your kids, Crow Not Crow is a great entry point and Cooped Up Kids can help take you further. The next book I wanna highlight is A Perfect Day for an Albatross. This is a really lovely book. It um, focuses on Mayali. Uh, oh, I think I said that not name wrong. I should have listened to recording. Um, but an albatross, a Lasian albatross on the Midway Atoll. And it follows her through a day in her life. And it has just these really gorgeous illustrations. And so this book guide, I think, does a really great job of letting the art speak uh, and I'll, I'll elaborate on what I mean by that in a second but it's from the perspective of this albatross as she's observing the world around her so the artwork in this book is really stylized and very gorgeous and one of the activities in the guide here really focuses on that and focuses on how you could interpret these pictures, which I think is really fun for kids who don't always, you know, haven't always been asked these questions. How do you, how is the artist showing movement? How do you know that it's showing movement? Can you tell which direction things are moving in? So it really encourages a close look at the art as well. It also dives into some biology about these birds, including their absolutely incredible wingspan. So albatrosses are famous for their ability to fly effortlessly for long, long distances just by gliding over the ocean. I've seen them before just out in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of nowhere, and they're just happy as a clam floating, making it look so easy to fly over the ocean at, for great periods of time. And part of that is made possible by their incredible wingspan, which can be hard to really visualize what that means. So this activity includes a, a little template so that you can make your own wings and cut them out. Um, here you have my boss's daughter modeling her amazing wings to really give you and your students an idea of what that wingspan looks like in real life, because it is kind of mind blowing. One of my very favorite activities in this guide, however, is the dance like a tross activity. So it's a really fun activity where you watch a video, which I'll show in just a moment here, of albatrosses doing their elaborate courtship displays which are these really ritualistic movements that uh, we then challenge kids to mimic. And you can see here in the corner of this slide that the dance is illustrated beautifully in the book as well. So we'll watch just a little clip of trosses doing their thing.
I'll go ahead and stop it there. But you get an idea of uh, some of the really fun, amazing dance moves these birds have and how fun it could be to do these with your students. <laughs> Carrie, that's hilarious. So in the chat, Carrie saying if we uh, outfit our students with proportional albatross beak and wings, we can certainly enforce social distancing. <laughs> awesome. So these dancing activities are super fun. Uh, your kids will love it. Uh, there's also ways that you can expand on that too. So you can teach the different dance moves and you could do kind of like a Simon says, or we call birdie says version where you say, birdie says, do the head shake. Birdie says, do the wing tuck um, and have a fun game like that as well. So as I mentioned, these dances are part of courtship. And if you are interested in diving more into what that means with your students outside of just albatross, there is another, um, well, let me go to the next slide, please. There we go. <laughs> there's another cooped up kids activity for that. I feel like I'm saying there's an app for that. Um, activity two, courtship and song, really dives into the nesting cycle um, and it focuses in particularly on um, finding, finding your mate part of that, the activity two does, and it focuses in on courtship introduces the idea of what courtship displays are and then gets into some dance moves. So here's the how to dance trust style, but then there's also this Birds of Paradise video. So you could compare the different styles of uh, a small songbird versus this large seabird and how they go about dancing. Biologically, one of the cool things is that um, in the case of the bird of paradise, this male is trying to impress a female and might mate with multiple females, whereas in the albatross, this dance is really a pair bonding thing. So these albatross will mate and stay with each other for long periods of time. Okay, cool. So um, one other activity I wanted to highlight because it has brings up some interesting human impact components is stash the trash. Um, so you may or may not be aware that plastics are a really big problem in our oceans. And this image here is a little upsetting, um, but this is a young albatross chick that had died because it had its stomach full of plastic. So the challenge is that when plastic ends up in our ocean and begins to degrade in the water, it releases a chemical that smells to the birds like their food does. So it can actually attract them into eating it, um, which is a big problem. And so it has a lot of real world impacts. We um, are currently studying it. I wanna say that this is from 2019, this, oh, 2020, there it is, March, 2020, this, this publish, paper was published, looking at the Northern Fulmar, which is actually a really hardy species that doesn't um, die from plastic consumption as easily. So it actually allows us to kind of survey uh, a sample of plastic levels within the Arctic subregion. So if you are working with older kids, there's a great video that you could watch about that, but it has real world implications is the reason I wanted to share this. And so this activity challenges you to go out into your schoolyard if you and safely collect trash if you can, and then weigh that trash and think a little bit about um, you know, your watershed and how this trash could end up in water bodies that would affect not necessarily, not always seabirds, obviously, if you're in the middle of the country, but, you know, uh, local wildlife in your lakes and such. So the next book we're going to talk about is Winged Heroes for All Bird Kind. This is a different 
book than we've talked about. This is a graphic novel. It's a longer story, um, heavily illustrated because it, it it's a comic book style book. Um, but it's really fun and it's for older age groups. And so the activity guide has standards for grades three through five. Um, and the book itself is, is really fun and has a lot of great themes in it. So in the book, we follow the story of Emilio, who is a pigeon um, that lives in New York City and is kind of in love with this comic book that has superhero birds in it and he wants to find these winged heroes and you know find out their secrets and how are they how are they superheroes when he feels like such an ordinary bird so we have themes of bravery and self-confidence the book also hits human impacts so um, a, a great way another great way to kind of introduce that idea and also the book talks about strength and diversity. Because it's a graphic novel, it has a lot of really great um, ELA and art tie-ins. So the like, very first activities kind of focuses on that. Um, so one of the themes is that Emilio is actually has his own amazing bird abilities and kind of discovers them throughout the story. And so throwing that question back to our students is the idea of activity one, like why is Emilio more than just a pigeon? Why are birds important to our environment and to our lives? And provides the opportunity to do some research and come up with a fun skit. Um, and then making your own drawing about superhero birds uh, in activity two. I wanted to highlight these two pages from the book. They're among the very first pages. Um, and you might actually recognize the skyline here as the New York City skyline with the 9-11 tribute lights shining. Um, and so the birds here, uh, these are the superhero birds, the winged heroes who are trying to protect their fellow songbirds from getting distracted by the lights and flying into buildings. And so they're using their status as predators to scare them away from the danger. And the reason I wanted to highlight these two pages is because they really are um, talking about a real life problem. So this is another um, article from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology website um, about how radar was used to determine the number of birds that were being affected by the 9-11 tribute lights and, or excuse me, not radar being used, but um, they, were, they were looking at collisions and they were counting birds um, that they could visibly see. And now we're using radar to let the folks running the tribute know, hey, tonight's a high migration night. And they can turn off the lights for a period of, of time and save thousands of birds' lives, which thankfully the folks running the tribute are 100% behind. Um, so it's a really cool partnership and it ties into other um, great ways that we as regular folks can help birds too, because even just the lights in our neighborhood can cause some challenges for our birds. So. <clears throat> that leads me to another activity in this guide, um, which is all about how students can be empowered to help migratory birds um, just through some simple actions. So it encourages you to explore the lights out movement. Um, the left hand graphic here is from that talks about ways that you can help birds during critical migration periods. Um, and then on the right, we see the seven simple actions, which are other ways that we in our everyday lives can help birds. So lots of great real world tie-ins with winged heroes. 
And I'm happy to say that there's going to be a cooped up kids that will support uh, this type of learning as well. The next cooped up kids will be released on December 20th, barring any unforeseen complications. And it's focused on bird superpowers. And so it has some super fun videos in it. Um, and it encourages kids to think about bird superpowers and, you know, what power would they have or what superpowers do they have? Um, so it's just a super fun uh, look at birds and their abilities. So check that out when it comes out on the 20th. And you can supplement your Winged Heroes reading by with some more fun activities. All right. The last book I wanted to highlight for you is On Meadowview Street. This is a slightly different um, version of one of our book guides. It's not a download. Um, it's just on our website. So if you go to the On Meadowview page, the whole guide is just there. And the lessons are, um, as you can see here, what's in a habitat, imagine life as a bird, what's in our habitat, how can we improve that for birds, and then has you do some project planning. So I love this book, I really do. I think it's very sweet. Um, and the story starts where um, this young girl has noticed a beautiful flower growing in their lawn. And her dad is out mowing the lawn and she asks him to mow around the flower. And her dad's on board because, hey, less mowing for him. So she builds what becomes a little, as you can see, sanctuary around that flower. And as she's realizing that more and more insects and birds and life is drawn to that area, she convinces her family to leave more and more of her yard to become like a meadow. And so now there is a meadow on Meadowview Street. Um, and so it kind of brings in ideas of habitat and native plants and things like that, which are great activity or great ideas to explore, um, great content. So it co covers what is, and excuse me, in the guide, we cover what's a habitat, what makes a habitat. Um, and it can lead to some really fun projects. So this is an old project from a group of third graders who put out bird feeders and realized that no birds were coming. And so they wanted to figure out why that might be. And so they started researching their local birds and realized that there just wasn't enough cover for the birds to feel safe to come and eat there and they needed a more vibrant habitat. Much like what happens in Meadowview Street, they wanted to have more native plants, more different kinds of plants growing. And so they made their drawings and their plans and went about improving their habitat. What I love about these drawings here is you can see that they're thinking about water, they're thinking about like different levels and plants and different food plants. We have milkweed here. They're thinking about bird houses, so places for them to nest, thinking about all the parts of co um, components of habitat. And they went about this great habitat improvement project. And sure enough, once they had improved their habitat, birds started coming to their bird feeders. So what I love about Meadowview Street is I think it can inspire really practical changes that you can make. And even little changes make a difference, just like the young girl preserving that one flower. So that is a super quick look at some of the bird guides, excuse me, book guides that we have out there. I hope that you found one that would be inspiring to you and your students. Um, there's lots more on those pages. Lots of different themes are covered. Um, definitely check them out. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I want to let you know that if you would like a contact hour, excuse me, a letter for a contact hour, um, we do 
do those. So um, you can email us at k12lab at cornell.edu and we'll send you a letter for one contact hour for your professional development. Um, we will also be sending out an email once the archive of this webinar is on our YouTube channel and it will include um, the links from tonight's webinar. So yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself for a second, but still be here to uh, answer questions for you. And we hope to see you at a webinar in the new year.